I came by to preach to somebody that all you want from God is to send him the gift. Lord, fix this, move this, change this, heal this, bless this. When the Lord says, when are you going to grow up to the place where you say, God, I don't need the gift. I just need your presence. I just need to know you're with me. I just need to know you're in this thing. I just need to know you got my back. I just need the Lord to be with me. Would you pray with me? God, there's not a one of us among this place today who don't know what it's like to have to wait on you experience the pause between the prayer and the answer yes. what seems to be the delay between our petition and your provision my prayers Lord for someone who's in that waiting cycle today that you remind them that if you wait on the Lord and be of good courage yes. God will strengthen your heart yes. pray today oh God that you would strengthen our hearts that you would speak to our lives yes. that you would shape us according to your word God, that you would allow Christ to be exalted in this moment, that somebody's life may be changed and transformed. Heal what hurts, strengthen what is weak, comfort, O oh God, what is grieving, and help us that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. For the past few weeks, I've been preaching out of a place where I find myself continuously, consistently hearing the same message in my life that is kind of undergirded all the messages I share with you. Trust God. In the midst of everything, trust God. Right. Sounds like the simplest message, but it's probably the hardest thing to do when life gets rough and tough on you. But learning how to trust God is key to our Christian development. And in that vein of learning to trust God, I'm going to invite you to hear some words from the pen of the Apostle Paul as he pens his letter to those Christians in Philippi in the book of the New Testament called Philippians. If you would journey with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, when you find verses six and seven, you may find some words that are quite familiar to you. All right. Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse number six. Some words there that if you didn't know already, my prayer is that you would know them very well by the time the benediction is given. Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse number six, here Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer, supplication, and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As we continue in this vein of trusting God today, I want to talk about the path to perfect peace. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Some of you may be aware from my personal testimony, I am a proud medical school dropout. <laughs> my first year of medical school, when I felt and sensed the Lord calling me to seminary, I was exposed, Lord, to something in that first year of medical training that confirmed to me the awesome, creative, omnipotent ability of God. It was in that first year of learning about healing that I witnessed something that I had never seen before but made me a firm believer in how awesome God is. For it was in that first year of medicine that I learned 
that one of the beauties and the mysteries of life is how God has crafted and shaped the human body with the innate and instinctive ability to heal itself. One of the great wonders of life is how God has made us in such a way that under the right conditions, your body will naturally heal itself. Your body is able to identify foreign matters and waste and promptly and quickly eliminate them. When you've been cut, proteins and platelets are rushed to the injury site that your blood may coagulate and prevent you from bleeding to death. That God has created within you this gift of an immune system that can create specific antibodies without the need of having antibiotics that fight off disease and infection instinctively and by its own desire. Your body has been created to heal itself. As a matter of fact, there were some physicians who would argue with you that medicines don't heal anything. Medicines treat symptoms but only the immune system heals the body, and that is a gift from God. Yeah. I'm not a doctor, and, but I am Reverend Doctor. <laughs> and I suggest to you that one of the reasons the health and wellness ministry of this church is so critical is to help us get back in that divine creative mode of understanding what John writes in 3 John 2 that God's desire is that we would prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prospers. And that Jesus declares in John 10, I come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. If you understand, and I haven't lost you, and understand that your body is creatively made by God to heal itself, I'll suggest to you that anything that attacks or weakens your body's ability to heal itself must be the result of us allowing into our lives or into our bodies that which is contrary to the plan and the purpose of God. Pause, rewind, press play. That if you understand God has created us to heal ourselves, then anything that weakens your body's ability to heal itself must be the result of us allowing into our bodies or into our lives that which is contrary to the plan and the design of God. Whether that be bad diets, whether that be lethargic lifestyle, whether that be drugs and chemicals, whether that be lifestyle that leads to disease, if it weakens your body's ability to heal itself, it cannot be part of the plan of God. And I'll suggest to you that if I still haven't lost you, that one of the greatest enemies to your body's ability to heal itself is not simply disease. One of the greatest enemies to your body's ability to heal itself is not even a fried chicken thigh. All right. One of the greatest enemies to your body's ability to heal itself is an invisible enemy called stress. Worry. Anxiety. A troubled spirit. Y'all, you would be surprised at the damage stress, worry, and anxiety does to your body. Tension and muscle aches, stress. Elevated blood pressure, stress. Heart problems, stress. Headaches, migraines, stress. Problems sleeping at night, stress. No patience, few so short, ruining your relationship with other folk. Stress, depression and anxiety, 
stress. As a matter of fact, it has been proven that stress can not only fertilize, but worsen certain conditions and diseases that are already present within your body. That stress fertilizes the growth of certain cancers in your life. I can prove it to you. That's why hospitals have visiting hours. Because some of y'all stress folk out. And after certain hours, you got to go. Because you are making things worse. What is not shocking is the fact that some of us live under daily stress all the time. The American Journal of Psychology suggests that 73% of us have something to worry about before 9 a.m. in the morning. Wow. That 43% of adverse health conditions are the result of stress. That 61% of us fail to get a good night's sleep because we're worried and upset about something. And this will get you 82% of doctor's visits are around stress-related ailments. Would you nudge your neighbor and tell them, you stress too much? <laughs> that our lives are filled with worry and anxiety that plagues us every day. Sometimes I wonder, JT, how did we get to this place? Oftentimes, look at my six and my nine-year-old playing in life, laughing, running, jumping, waking up excited every morning. They go to the refrigerator knowing food will be there. They turn on the light, not worried about whether it's going to come on or not. They get in the car, they don't know what insurance is, they can't even spell mortgage correctly. <laughs> and they're stressed about nothing. And I wonder, when did we lose that? Sometimes I look at them, I get so jealous. I want to sing from my old school, Jeffrey the Giraffe. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I got so many different games that I can play with, from bikes to trains to video games. It's the greatest toy store there is. I don't want to grow up because, baby, if I did, I wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid. I, I, it, it, does anybody here just wish you could be like Peter Pan, just never grow up, never have worry, never have stress, never have anxiety? Well, the next time worry wakes you up at night, and the next time stress finds you out early in the morning, the next time your heart is racing and your blood pressure is going up because you're anxious about what awaits you around the corner, I want you to hear these words of the Apostle Paul. Be anxious for nothing. Be worried about nothing. Be stressed out about nothing. Be upset about nothing. Let me give you some Greek real quick. The word nothing that Paul uses, although that's what your Bible translated, it is more frequently translated no one. Okay. You just missed your amen. <laughs> Be anxious over no one. Be upset over no Don't let nobody get underneath your skin. Don't let nobody upset your spirit. Don't let nobody steal your joy. Don't let nobody put fear in your heart. Be anxious over nobody. I, I know this isn't grammatically correct, but I can you look at your name and tell me I ain't studying you? I ain't, I ain't studying you. I, I, I ain't worried about you. I'm not upset about you. I'm, I hear Paul write these words. Be anxious over no thing or no one. And I sometimes wonder, what planet did he come from? What world did Paul live in? Because you see, my world gives me something to worry about every day. 
There's always another bill I didn't expect. There's always another issue I've got to handle. There's always another threat against me. There are always more enemies rising up. There's always folk running their mouth. And every day, I have something to worry about. And yet Paul says, be anxious for nothing. At the heart of Paul's argument is this, that there is something fundamentally wrong with a saint who's stressed out. All right. All right, there is something paradoxical about somebody who says they trust in God and are worried about everything. Something don't add up to folk who come to church every Sunday carrying Bibles Shouting at shouting time, giving at giving time, worshiping at worshiping time, but Monday through Friday, their blood pressure is up, they can't sleep at night, they're anxious, they're worried, their patience is short, there's something wrong about you saying you believe in God and you're worried about everything. Paul says, because you must not know that there's a quick formula to deal with your anxiety. There's something you can do to handle this stress. There's a path to perfect peace. That's what he says, read up on it. He says, listen, listen, when, when you're worried and anxious and stressed and life's got you in that place, he says there are three things you ought to do. It's right there in your Bible. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, watch it, prayer. Pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Touch somebody and tell them you need to pray. That, that Paul says prayer is critical to keeping calm in stressed out situations. Right. Prayer is critical to finding peace when your heart is filled with worry. As a matter of fact, it's so important that Paul puts it first on the list. It says that whatever you do, pray. Yeah. I see it maybe Paul puts it first because he understands that my instinct and my nature is to not always pray first. Right. My instinct is to worry about it. Right. My instinct is to jump in it and handle it myself. My instinct is to pick up the phone and get somebody told. Since this DC and y'all are corporate climbers, my instinct is to envision all the damage that could be done and develop a proper strategic plan to help me uh, navigate and manipulate my way out of this situation. My instinct is to think about all the things that could go wrong. My instinct is try to call my friends and get wise counsel. My instinct is to add up those who are against me and those who are for me and see which one weighs more in my life. My instinct is fight or flight. But Paul says, when you operate in the Lord, your instinct ought to be to pause and pray. And for five years, I've been telling you to read your Bible. I'm going to put a comma on that. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and talk to the Lord. Read your Bible and fall on your knees. Read your Bible and have a little talk with Jesus. And tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. You've got to learn how to pray. The boys are back in school now. Cooper's in first grade. They had a visitor to first grade, a fireman. He said, Cooper, what did the fireman teach you? He said, Daddy taught me that if I'm on fire, uh -huh. <laughs> stop, drop, and roll. I need to give you some good advice. When you are stressed out in life, stop, drop, and pray. When life gets rough on you, stop, drop, and lift up holy hands. When you don't know what to do, stop, 
drop and call on the name of the Lord. He, he, he says, pray. Now, um, before you get this wrong, this prayer that Paul uses, this first thing, it is not a recommendation to go to God and give God the laundry list of everything you want God to do. That's not what this word prayer means, because some of us, the only way we know how to pray is this. Lord, here I am. Fix this. Do this. Move this. Give me this. Bless this. Change this. Work this out. Amen. See you tomorrow. Paul, the word for prayer that Paul uses here is pros who hey. It, 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 it not only refers to praying. But pros who hate, literally, Shelly, it means to create a place of prayer where there's no synagogue. Stay with me, stay with me. That's why we come to Alpha Street. This ain't kindergarten. He said, listen, pros who hate, pray, is what Jews did when they found themselves outside of the proximity of a religious establishment where God would dwell. But they believed in a God who could show up wherever they created a space and called on his name. And so even in the wilderness, they would pros who hey. Even with enemies around, they would pros who hey. Even when they found themselves in worse situations, they said, I may not be in church. It may not be a temple. It may not be a synagogue. But right here, I can create some sacred space where I can call on God and God will dwell with me and I will dwell with God. That what it means to pray is to draw close to God, to call Call on God to invite God into your situation, to believe that God will tabernacle with you, that God is a transcendent in your situation. Okay, okay, it's, it's hard preaching at 8 o'clock. Um, yesterday, yesterday, we, we had a, a, a marvelous wedding here at the church uh, between Mark Stafford and Sophia Hunt, two beautiful people got married. And when I was talking to Mark, uh, about the wedding, and we were talking about all the plans. He said, Pastor, you know, the wedding's on Saturday at noon, um, and the reception is afterwards. He said, are you coming to the reception? I, I said, your reception's on Saturday afternoon? He said, yeah. I said, Mark, um, I, I, one, I typically don't go to receptions because uh, folk don't, don't, don't enjoy themselves when the pastor's around. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, folk want to go over there and get that, but while I'm here, they don't want me to see it in their hands. So they, you know, they, they just, you know, they, and, and they, 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 they don't have fun when I'm around. And, and, and with your reception being in the afternoon, I don't know if I get my mind right to get ready to go back to church and stand in the pulpit after being at a reception for a couple of hours. So, so I'm not going to come to the reception. Mark looked dejected. I said to him, I said, but, but, but I'll send my gift. I mean, I saw your registry, I picked out a gift, I I'll send the gift, I just won't be there. This is what Mark said to me, he said, Pastor, we don't want your gift, we want your presence. That what makes me sad is not anything about a gift, it's knowing that you won't be there. I came by to preach to somebody that all you want from God is to send him the gift. Lord, fix this, move this, change this, heal this, bless this. When the Lord says, when are you going to grow up to the place where you say, God, I don't need the gift. I just need your presence. I just need to know you're with me. I just need to know you're in this thing. I just need to know you got my back. I just need the Lord to be with me. That's how you know you're praying when you're seeking the presence of God wow. and inviting God into the party and demanding that God show his presence. God, I pray to draw nigh to you. But then Paul says, listen, if you want to find peace, not only must you pray, he says, but all things with prayer and supplication. Somebody say, and supplication. That word supplication, here's the good part. That, that word means to ask. It's what Paul goes on later to say, let your request be made known unto God. Uh -huh. This way he says, pray and ask him for what you need. Pray 
and tell him what you want him to do. Y'all, y'all, th- th- this is so amazing. The Paul says, I can supplicate. I can make my requests known to God. I can share with God the desires of my heart. Now, now that, that, that ought to make you say amen twice. The first reason you ought to say amen is because you know, the majority of people you know in life, if you go to them and you start telling them everything that's wrong with you and ask them for everything you want them to do, the majority of people you know are going to ask you a real good question. What does that have to do with me? I got my own troubles. How do your problems become my problems? And how do you expect me to help you when I got my own stuff? That's most people. Paul says, but we serve a God who with everything else he's got going on is a God who says, come to me and supplicate. I know I'm running the universe. I know I'm keeping the stars in their celestial sockets. I know that I'm keeping the orbits in their proper perspective. I know I'm working on that brother and working in that war and down in that country, but I'm so much God that I care about every little detail and situation in your life. Everything about you I care about. That, that, that's what blew David's mind when he wrote Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And God, when I consider the heavens you've made, and when I consider all that you got to do every day, when I consider your glory in the heavens, who am I that you are mindful of me? But I'm so glad that I've got a God who's mindful of me. A God who cares about my stuff. A God who says, ask what you need me to do. Because he cares. And not only does he care, here's the second amen. He's able. Oh, God. Come here. Because there's some folk you can ask. But they ain't able. Can I help you? When you're really stressed out, there really are very few things people can do to help you. You can encourage me. You can pray for me. But at 3 in the morning, when I wake up with this heavy on my mind, really ain't nothing you can do. You're unable to make this go away. You're unable to resolve this issue in my life. But the good news is, is that when I supplicate to God, I'm saying that I believe I can ask and he's able to answer. That whatever I petition, God can provide. Can, 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 Can I tell you why so many people have a deficient prayer life? Because they really don't understand how excited God gets when you ask. Can can I help you real quick? Because you don't ask somebody for something you don't think they can do. I'm not going to ask you for $25,000 because you ain't got 25. (laughs) And I'm only going to ask you for what I know you got. So God said, reason your prayer life so deficient It's because you keep asking for itty bitty little little stuff and you're offending me by suggesting that that's all I got in my reservoir. So when you pray, ask for the impossible. Ask for the unprecedented. Ask for the healing. Ask for the deliverance. Ask me for great things because I am a great God. Is there anybody here who believes that God can do anything? He can make any way. He can open any door. He can fix any problem. That that my prayer 
is indicative of my faith in him. That what I'm asking him for is indicative of what I believe he's able to do. Let me give you a side order of scripture. The Bible says, you have not because you ask not. You're sitting around sick because you ain't asked for healing. You're sitting around broke because you ain't asked for deliverance. You're sitting around lonely because you haven't asked for joy. Ask and I can give it. God, I feel like preaching now. Help yourself, Reverend. says, in everything, pray, draw nigh to me, supplicate, Baby, lay it on the line and ask me. He says, and with thanksgiving. Uh, says, he says, thanksgiving is going to make this a whole lot better. Prayer is good. It's better with thanksgiving. Supplicating is good, but it's better with thanksgiving. You, you know what thanksgiving is like in the life of a believer? like hot sauce. Because everything is better with some hot sauce. F fried chicken is better with some hot sauce. Collard greens better with some hot sauce. And cheese popcorn. Told y'all I'm from Chicago. It's, it's better with some hot sauce. He says, whatever it is, add some thanksgiving. Yeah. Now, why does Paul say this? Because Paul understands that when you're stressed out, when you're worried, when you're anxious, when you're losing sleep, you have the ability to have tunnel vision where all you see is what's stressing you out. Paul says every now and then in the middle of your stressed out self, I need you to take your blinders off and see the grander scope of God's glory in your life and know that yes, you got something to stress about and yes, that's upsetting you and yes, that's worrying you. But baby, that ain't all that God is up to in your world that if you pause and balance out your days, you'll see I got some stuff to stress about. Oh, but I got some stuff to shout about. I got some stuff to be worried about. I got some stuff to be grateful for. And when you add up your good days uh, and measure them to your bad days, you'll find out that your good days, they shown up outweigh your bad days. Uh, and you got a reason to be grateful. Somebody say, with thanksgiving. Now, now, let's, let's, let's take the sanctified mask off for a minute and acknowledge and admit that sometimes giving thanks is hard to do. Three people on your pew didn't stand up and shout already. Just. Reverend, I get you, but sometimes it's so rough. God knows it hurts so bad that it's hard for me to say thank you. That I can't see how this is going to turn out well. And my inability to envision victory dampens my present capacity to say thank you. Because of what I can't see, I can't say thanks. Wow. I know I have a reason to be grateful, but God, I'm so worried about Monday that I can't shout on Sunday. And that's why God says, listen, in your present, I'm not only giving you the gift of vision, but I've given you the gift of memory. So that when you can't see it now, remember. Look back at yesterday. Press rewind for a week. Turn the page back to last month. Go back to last year. And I promise you, there are some things God did yesterday and some things God did last month that you did not accurately thank him for. So in your presence, give him the thanksgiving from yesterday that he is due for what he's already done. Uh -huh. okay, okay. 
<laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Rosette, Rosette called me in the office a little while ago, and it was a few weeks ago, back in August, yeah, yeah. and Greg, she was laughing. She said, Pastor, you need to come see this. I said, Rosette, what is it? And she pulled out um, a birthday card for me. It's August. My birthday is in April. <laughs> a member sent in a birthday card in August, but my birthday is in April. Rosette and I were laughing. I said, you know, belated birthday cards, that, that week, two weeks, three weeks at most. <laughs> but, but baby, you five months off. You might as well send me an early birthday card for next year. It, it, I can't believe somebody sent me a birthday card in August and my birthday was in April. So I pulled the card out on the front. It said, belated happy birthday. Opened the card up, said, it's never too late to celebrate. Yeah. And inside was a $50 bill. <laughs> and I said, it's never too late to celebrate. Is there anybody here that's got some belated Thanksgiving and can declare it's never too late to celebrate the goodness of the Lord? That when I think of what it did last month and what it did last week, I know it's bad right now, but I thank God for what he's already done. Somebody just say it's never too late to celebrate. I, I, I got to go. It's time for Sunday school. He says, pray, supplicate, and give thanks. And watch the end result. Here's the formula. When you add prayer to supplication and thanksgiving, the end result is the peace of God. The, the, the peace of God. The ahene hotheos, this peace that is not of man. This, this is not the peace some zeros in your bank account will give you. This is not the peace that you find in the arms of a lover. This is not the peace that's located at the bottom of a bottle. This is the peace that Jesus spoke in the midst of the storm. This is the peace that allowed Daniel to lay down and sleep in the lion's den. This is the peace they allowed Paul to stand in the courtroom of Agrippa believing that God was already there. This is the peace that allowed Esther to go into the king and declare, if I perish, I perish. This is the peace that held Job together when life had stripped him of everything he held near and dear to his heart. This is the peace that allows me to have courage in my leg and backbone in my back and believing that my God is able to handle all things in my life. He says, and this peace will guard your heart and mine. Yeah, yeah. Give you last little homework here. Guard, the word guard, it, it has uh, really two meanings. Mm -hmm. When he says it'll guard your heart and mine, one meaning you already understand. It literally means to prevent an invasion. Like that word guard was used for a military barricade that was meant to keep the uh, onslaught of an invader from coming into a land. That's what it meant to guard. But also you're going to find out, Adam, that that word guard was also used for when a city was besieged by an enemy and there were some citizens who wanted to defect and leave. So to guard meant that they not only kept the enemy out, but they kept the citizens in. Okay, okay. Um, let me see if I can give you a better definition. Um, despite my south side tendencies, one of my favorite pastimes is go to the theater. I love good plays. I'm not a big musical fan, but I love drama. Love going to Broadway. The reason I like Broadway is because my parents exposed me to theater in the late 80s. And they exposed me to something that put a love in my heart for what I argue is one of the greatest 
American playwrights of the 20th century, a two-time Pulitzer winner by the name of August Wilson. Yes, yes. August Wilson is most famous for 10 plays called The Pittsburgh Cycle. And in The Pittsburgh Cycle, in these 10 plays like Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Two Trains Running, Seven Guitars, Piano Lesson, he chronicles the comedy and tragedy of African-American life in the 20th century, and each play is specific to a particular decade in the 20th century. If you ever see an August Wilson play, you got to go. If you ever see it out, go on the recommendation of your pastor. In the late 80s, my parents brought me to New York to see an August Wilson play that swept the Tony Awards. The play was situated in the 1950s, and it starred James Earl Jones. The play was called Fences. If you ever see Fences playing anywhere near you, go on the recommendation of your pastor. It is arguably one of the greatest plays I've ever seen. Situated in the 1950s is a story about a beleaguered African-American brother named Troy, former baseball player, experienced great racism in his life. He's got a son named Corey, a wife named Rose, a best friend named Bono. The play really situates around different themes. On the one hand, there's a tension between Troy and his son, Corey. Corey, who receives a full scholarship to play football, but his dad is so haunted by his own experience with racism that he's against Corey playing football, and there's tension between them. Part of the play revolves around his relationship with his wife, Rose, because it is found out in the play that Troy has a lover named Alberta who gives birth to a baby girl. Alberta dies. And as was the case in the 50s, the wife adopted and took in the love child of her husband. The play centers around the fact that Rose and Troy have bought a house with money that came from the disability of Troy's younger brother, older brother, and what Rose wants more than anything is for Troy to build a fence around the property to delineate what belongs to them. In one of the greatest monologues in dramatic history, in Act Two, Scene One, Troy stands up and gives this long monologue speaking allegorically about the fence. And in his mind, the fence serves one purpose to keep the grim reaper off of his property. Yeah. Troy is haunted by images of death. He believes that this fence will keep death off of his property. I don't want to tell you how it all ends, but at the end of the play, the fence is finished. Troy is not in the picture. And Rose looks at the fence, and this is what she says. Some fences were meant to keep things out. Other fences were meant to keep things in. That this fence not only keeps the evil out, but it ought to keep the good in. That when there's some stuff that wants to get out, there is a fence that guards it so that what needs to stay in remains in, and what needs to stay out remains out. That's what Paul says about the peace of God. It guards me. It keeps some stuff out, and it locks some stuff in. It keeps anxiety out, but it locks joy in. It keeps frustration out, but it locks faith in. It keeps worry out, but it allows my strength to stay within me so that even when the problem doesn't go away and even when the enemies keep raging and even when the situation gets worse, there's some stuff locked on the inside of me that allows me to get up every morning with joy in my heart and a hallelujah on my mind and thanking God for this day that the Lord has made. Yeah. 
That's, that's how I can face today because I'm guarded. The joy I should have lost, I still have. The strength I would have lost, I still have. The faith I would have lost, I still have because he's guarding me. Pray, supplicate, and add thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We bow before you, Lord, knowing that our Bibles and our offerings were not the only thing we brought to church this morning. We brought some worry. We sure enough brought some fears. We brought some anxieties. So we bow before you in prayer to draw nigh to you. Desiring first and foremost your presence in our lives. In every situation, God, show yourself strong. And we supplicate as a testament of our faith in you. I ask you, God, for the miraculous. I ask you for what others believe is impossible. I ask you to do what no human hand can do because you're God and I know you're able. And in the middle of it, God, I say thank you. If not for what I have right now, God, I give you some belated thanksgiving for everything you've already done. And in exchange, God, all I ask is for your peace to guard my heart and mind. As I go into Monday, as I face Tuesday, as Wednesday comes, guard my heart and mind. Give me the strength to trust in you and allow your peace to have authority over me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.